Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Pfister. Uh, we're looking today uh, in our second uh, uh, artist series, The Ism and the Artist. Uh, we talked about Impressionism last time, and so now let's talk about Mary Cassatt. Let's get started. So Mary Cassatt was a unique artist uh, because she was a woman who succeeded in what was, in the 19th century, predominantly a male profession. She was the only American invited to exhibit with a group of independent artists, artists later known as the Impressionists, because she responded in a very distinctive way to their mandate to portray modern life. She lived most of her life in Europe where she thought she could escape the oppressive patriarchal attitude in America. She was born into an affluent family in Pennsylvania. Her father was a stockbroker. Her mother was from an old established family, very accomplished and spoke French fluently. Um, she traveled with her family extensively in Europe, um, helping to uh, find a cure for her brother with his diseased knees, and also to provide schooling for her brother Alexander. And this is where Mary learned French and German. And uh, 19, 1861, at age 16, she decided to enroll at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts against her father's wishes. He was, of course, looking for her to fill a more domestic role, which Mary dismissed. After studying in Spain and Belgium in 1874, she settled in Paris and remained there and in France for the majority of the rest of her life. She actually had a, a, about 305 artworks and we're gonna look at about 20. So I really encourage you to go uh, take a look at some of Mary's other works as well. So after exhibiting in the French Salon uh, uh, during the years from 1872 on, in Edgar de, uh, she met Edgar Degas in 1877, and he would remain a close friend throughout um, her life and really considerably influenced her own work as well. It was Degas that had asked her to exhibit with the Impressionists. She said of the invitation, I accepted with joy. At last I could work with absolute independence without considering the opinion of the jury. I had already recognized whom were my true masters. I admired Manet, Corbet and Degas. I hated conventional art. I began to live. So Mary participated in the Impressionist exhibitions of 1879, 1880, 1881, and 86. Besides participating in the shows, uh, she also promoted works of the Impressionists in the USA. And she actually encouraged her brothers who were still in the States uh, to um, purchase works as well. Her great friends were the Havemeyers who built up an important collection of Impressionists and other contemporary French artists, which can now be found at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And Mary actually brought a lot of Impressionist art over to America. We really have a, a great um, debt we owe her for um, um, encouraging people to um, purchase the Impressionists. Now, one of the main reasons that Cassatt came to Europe to work other than it being the center of the art world at the time, was that she felt there was a more favorable climate for women's activity in Europe than in her native America. Cassatt said, after all, give me France. Women do not have to fight for recognition here if they do, do serious work. In the same vein, Cassatt also became enmeshed in radical politics of the day and was a staunch supporter of the women's right to vote. Because she was a woman, an American and an impressionist, she had been neglected and left out of the history of art though was actually well regarded by critics in her time. With the women's movement in the 1960s, however, Cassatt and many other women have begun to receive the recognition they so richly deserve. It is important to note that she was accepted as an artist in her own right while she was alive. It was mainly the ensuing decades that erased her and her work from the art history books. Now let's take a look at her life and works. Now, Cassatt had a role model of uh, very strong women and mostly from her mother. Uh, Louise Havemeyer, one of Cassatt's greatest patrons and collectors, said of Mary's mother, anyone who had the privilege of knowing Mary Cassatt's mother would know at once that it was from her and her alone that Mary inherited her ability. Her mother spoke French fluently and was extraordinarily well-read. This portrait of her mother shows an unusual, if not unique image for a mother. Mrs. Cassatt is shown seriously engaged in an intellectual pursuit that invites comparison, not with the traditional iconography of women of mothers, but rather with portraits of intellectuals. Now, I don't mean to say that women at the time did not read. It's just that they were never portrayed this way. 
They were much more portrayed as in uh, mother and child um, and, and doing other pursuits such as that. So this was really a different portrayal of women at the time. So Cassatt had this wonderful role model at, 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 um, right at hand and um, made many uh, um, uh, paintings of uh, women pursu uh, pursuing reading, which we'll take a look at later. Um, and uh, why they would, another thing they would also be considered at this time is most of the time uh, women were either considered mothers or goddesses or prostitutes. And in fact, in 1870, there were an estimated 145 brothels, official brothels in Paris. Kind of amazing. Uh, this painting is one of her earliest um, intellectual type paintings and a transition from her earlier paintings uh, to those with the Impressionists. So we see Mrs. Dufay here seated on a striped uh, red and yellow silk uh, set against a background of warm gray. Uh, she's wearing this brilliant blue dress with the pink and white details on the sleeves. Um, we have kind of this beautiful coloration, this quiet interior setting, and um, this occupation of the sitter um, really shows, also shows some of the influence of other artists on Mary Cassatt from this time, uh, particularly um, Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Uh, really just a beautiful, again, rendering of this. Um, and here we have another uh, reader who apparently looks lost in her book there. Um, she, she painted the reader in which the book itself actually gains prominence, being placed firmly uh, um, in the hands of this absorbed young woman, creating a kind of barrier between the spectator and the sitter, admonishing the, us, the viewer, to maintain a respectful distance, to be silent and, have, um, and be appropriate um, to the matter in which we're looking at this here. So again, just these, uh, these beautiful things. And we'll notice in a lot of Mary Cassatt paintings that the viewers, the, uh, the, the people in the painting are not looking at us. They're rather engaged in their pursuits. So also something uh, kind of very different and very much portraying a modern woman who does not, is not concerned what other people are thinking. So while it was difficult for readers and writers to make their way in the late 19th century, or female readers and writers, was even more difficult for female painters. In this painting, we see a young girl absorbed in the study of art. This is not a naive and untutored eye of a young girl, but rather a young girl's serious and intense study, unusual for its earnestness in one whose age dress and apparent class might hint at more frivolous pursuits. This painting belongs with the rare but important um, representations of children that are to be found in the first decade of Cassatt's document work. It's tempting to read it as autobiographical, as it more than likely springs from the artist's recollections of her own childhood, but we have no specific record of that. Now, all of the images that we've seen so far are presented without any concern to emphasize the social roles so important in the 19th century society. Instead, the early paintings were unified by the recurring images of self-contained and mental activities in which women were engaged, reading books, newspapers, and studying prints. These features constitute the fundamental theme of Cassatt's body of work. Women in her paintings, again, rarely look out at the picture or meet the gaze of the viewer. They are absorbed in their own activities. Uh, Cassatt first exhibited this with the Impressionists in 1879. Uh, this is one of two paintings that she showed. From her arrival in Paris, she had uh, participated in the official salons in Paris, but abandoned that when she began to work um, with the Impressionist. So even this was probably her sister Lydia taking a cup of tea. Again, not engaged with us, but in her own thoughts. Uh, this is the other painting that she had in the show. Uh, we really have this really bright and uh, luminous color and fluent brushwork um, and really placed her very well within the Impressionist group. Um, this is also one of her first paintings that is set in the theater, um, uh, which is again one of the activities that a middle class woman uh, could participate in outside of the home. Um, and another example of modern life that the Impressionist so admired. Um, we see it's a little bit off there in the back, um, but we really see this very self-assured woman out here um, and this beautiful, the brushwork and just that, mag those magnificent flesh tones. Really beautiful. 
Uh, this canvas was exhibited in the Sixth Impressionist Show. Uh, this was painted in the garden of the villa that the Cassatt family rented for the summer in Marley. A nearby neighbor was Edward Manet, and it is his influence that is strongest in this painting of her older sister, Lydia. There, we have this very bright sunlight, um, um, kind of shining on the frothy layers of that lace hat that she has here. Um, Lydia looks kind of a little pallid there, but this is a reminder um, that Lydia was actually an invalid and would pass away two years later. Um, the enclosed garden, um, again, suggests this secluded life that it, Lydia's illness required, but also that most women were confined to. Uh, we do have a very beautiful and brilliant varied palette and very loose and free brushstrokes. Now, visiting to take tea was a part of the daily round of many middle class women of this period. In the painting, it is the subject of one of the interiors, which prompted the admiring comments of critics when they saw her work in the fifth Impressionist show. It is, however, tempting to interpret the compressed space of the painting as something other than the happy, harmonious quietness. So we kind of see this pressure of the figures kind of um, against the, the, the side there um, and kind of the, also the, their, 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 their dresses there that kind of looks like very tight and compressed. So kind of that, that idea that she's showing that this is this confinement of space that we have to keep them in. We also see the, the patterning uh, there in the wallpaper and also the painting on the right uh, shows the influence of Japanese prints which were circulating at the time. Uh, here is another young woman of a painting sewing, uh, more than a uh, woman sewing, more than likely it is Lydia. Uh, again, we have this beautiful impressionist color with the pinks and the greens in the background, uh, this beautiful outdoor setting giving us this idea of the light. Um, and really just how the beautiful, how the light falls on her. And, and again, the figure looks is towards us, faces towards us, but does not look at us. Uh, this is really the strongest of Cassatt's uh, series of loge scenes. And, um, um, and uh, we see this woman here in black kind of serves as the entrance into the auditorium where the smaller figures also dressed in black kind of help uh, draw us all together there. But if we follow the gaze from, the, um, uh, from her opera glasses, we see an, uh, uh, an interesting um, little fact there that there is a gentleman pointing opera glasses at her and she becomes the object of the gaze. However, because this woman is so dominant and she's so clearly focused towards the stage, it is she that dominates the gaze um, for the viewer. So uh, Cassatt continues this theme at the theater. Um, the, these models were two young ladies that uh, Cassatt was acquainted with. Uh, these are kind of very, these ladies look very stiff and formal. So they were probably on the brink of womanhood and also socially. This might have been their first time out. So they're rather shy. One's holding the bouquet and one's holding the, the fan there very tight. And so you kind of see um, all the trappings of the age, class and sex of these two fashionable young women are really portrayed with this kind of contemporary realism and factual accuracy, but they do not determine the nature of the image. Instead, they throw into relief the unusual seriousness and the subjective con consciousness of etiquette and social convention that Cassatt alone of the Impressionists perceived and portrayed in young womanhood. So this is just saying that Mary Cassatt knew how to um, um, instill or uh, kind of distill uh, the, this essence of young womanhood um, because this is something that she knew, that she lived with and went with. Now, uh, there are very few representations of men in Cassatt's work, and those are usually of her father or brothers or young infants. And um, a very simple explanation of this is that the social convention made it unsuitable for a woman to be alone in a studio with a male unless it was a close relative. Women artists were also denied access on account of propriety and decency to paint the male nude, um, except from plaster casts, and thus they had very little knowledge of the male figure. Um, in the Toreador, however, we see the strong image of a man with strong color contrasts of the red tie and caps and the blue and silver embroidered jacket. Um, he's very, very modern here, smoking a cigarette. Um, kind of see this dazzling display of color and virtuoso. 
Um, another aspect of the lack of men in her paintings was the firm restriction placed on her sex and class, which prohibited the knowledge of the world of men. Despite many friendships uh, with artists like Degas and Manet, along with her fathers and brothers, she mainly lived apart from any close or daily contact with the world, um, from the world of men. And so she was really cut off from all the avenues open to men, as were all the female impressionists. And so they really, they drew what they knew and drew what they saw, but it was so much a part of modern life as, as well. Um, one critic said, uh, after looking at Miss Cassatt's painting, she, he said, for the first time, thanks to Miss Cassatt, I have seen the likenesses of ravishing children, quiet bourgeois scenes painted with a delicate and charming tenderness. So really kind of neat. You see the critics here are not opposed to her and recognizing her talent. Um, we know the adult male may be absent, uh, but there's many small boys and male infants are um, clearly pr uh, present in a lot of um, her paintings. Um, Cassatt did not really emphasize a sexual difference in the, in the um, very young. One of the first renderings of the mother and child motif um, which was certainly familiar with through her studies of Madonnas and Child and the works of the old masters, was this painting. Here many of the threads of her career come together, childhood and womanhood, and the stylistic influence of both the old masters and of the new avant-garde. And so you do, and just see this beautiful idea of the mother looking at the child, but not really engaged of us, so we're just kind of seeing this d distilled womanhood here, quite beautiful. In this painting, uh, Cassatz initiated her great phase of treatments of the maternal theme, a subject she had, which she'd only actually worked infrequently on in the intervening decade. Uh, close dependence and security are conveyed, um, but really through the binding gestures of the hand. The mother and child, again, do not look at each other, but are linked by that physical bond, um, by the child's hand on the mother's face and the mother's um, on, on the child's uh, young, young bodies. So again, really this beautiful thing. We can also see if we look at it, this painting is unfinished. And so we kind of get a chance to see kind of the underpainting of what Cassatt does um, and how she handles things like that. So we kind of see the, the same uh, baby's gesture um, in this one right here called Baby's First Caress. Um, Cassatt has caught a rarely portrayed moment, a child's first intuition of separateness from its mother as it reaches out kind of to examine her as this distant object that's separate from itself, having once been inside. Uh, there's kind of this really penetrating intensity and sure mastery of her medium and composition and really kind of grabs this crucial development um, in a child's, uh, a, a crucial moment in a child's development where they're realizing that like their mother is an actual person and something other than themselves. Um, also kind of, it's a modern version of the Madonna and Child. Uh, this one, um, Edgar Degas' reaction to this painting was reported by Cassatt to Louise Havemeyer. When he saw my boy before a mirror, he said to the gallery owner, Duran Ruel, where is she? I must see her at once. It is the greatest painting of the century. When I saw him, he went over all the detail of the picture with me and expressed great admiration for it. And then as if regretting what he had said, he relentlessly added, it has all your qualities and all your faults. It is the infant Jesus with his English nurse. So very interesting there and quite a compliment. Uh, uh, the critic Sigard actually went so far as to suggest an alternative title for this painting. Um, he thought it could be called the Adoration after a religious composition by the Italian Renaissance artist Parma Giannino. And you kind of had this very complex um, articulation of these three figures here um, and kind of this freeze-like comp uh, composition going across, but all linked through the hands here. Um, and here, it's kind of an example of what he was talking about, linking her um, uh, again to these adoration things. And this is a, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's um, uh, Mary, St. Mary, Mary, Christ, St. John the Baptist, and Christ. And this is da Vinci's Madonna of the Rocks. Um, and they also look away as well as Cassatt does, but again, are linked by their hand gestures. 
So with directness and authenticity, um, Cassatt shows a less conventional idea of little girls. And here's kind of a, an awkward plain little girl with her little plump body and childish straight limbs is being bathed by a very businesslike mother. And again, this structure of interrelating forms really conveys the maternal relationship um, and, and much more and in, in, in really lets go of any of that superficial appeal to us, but just this beautiful scene that m mothers have done a thousand times over. Um, Degas also kind of used this tilted uh, perspective in his studies of women bathing um, to give this effect, effect kind of, of peeking through a keyhole. Um, and we can see that here in his example of the tub. And it kind of seems kind of unusual here. Um, but again, it's this idea also of the Japanese prints that we talked about before and of taking these different angles to see them. So you can kind of see Degas' influence on her um, in, in, in uh, how she is painting, but not in the subject matter. Uh, this one almost seems to have a little fewer connotations. It kind of looks like mom is very tired there. Um, we see uh, again, this, this kind of this whole connection through their arms um, linked together and the limbs kind of all intertwined. It's hard to see whose is whose, um, but really just kind of this, this very beautiful theme of a maternal theme and um, this kind of idea to show uh, youth and maturity at the same time through the child and the mother. But again, a male would not have had access to something like this. So we have quite a peek into what modern life was like for um, a young mother and child in the late 19th century. Now, the common notion that uh, Cassatt reworked the religiously symbolic icon of Madonna and child can be replaced by the idea that she used the child and its parent to express um, instead an idea of the phases of life, um, an assertion already suggested by the paintings that we have seen. Um, we've seen mother and child, young womanhood, and then the older women at the loge there. Um, now this painting from her Impressionist period really um, presents a completely novel and honest treatment of kind of this, the uh, just the ungainliness sometimes of children as they're growing and changing and shaping. And this, again, this pose is kind of also reminiscent of Degas with this kind of awkward angle, um, uh, looking at it from enough. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Degas actually worked on this painting and Cassatt told a dealer, I did it in 78 or 79. It was a child of a friend of Monsieur in the armchair and found it good. And, advi and he advised me on the background and even worked on it. I sent it to the American uh, section of the exposition in 1878, and they refused it. I was furious, all the more so because Degas had worked on it. So it, also this is very reflective of kind of the, the Japanese prints of the time with these cut off angles um, and this really close up view of what we're seeing. But really just um, uh, not only just a picture of a child, but also of the child's view and seeing what she's looking at, tired or waiting to go out or something like that. So this painting was ex executed later in her career and kind of brings together all the threads of Cassatt's program as an artist and the stylistic means developed within the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist of the French art in order to reveal that process. It's kind of, again, this very complex picture which brings together all types of forms and meanings. So Cassatt had evolved throughout her career before encroaching blindness and inca inca incapacitated her career. Uh, so we have this very beautiful mother in all her finery, looked like she's getting ready to go out, again with the young daughter um, sitting on her lap, probably just fresh out of the bath. Kind of this whole different spatial organization because we know that Cassatt never really shows us the faces, but here with the mirror, we are actually seeing the child's face straight on. So really kind of a, a very complex idea for her. And you see over here at the right, um, uh, a, a print by Kitagawa Utamaro, um, which shows where she might have gotten the influence to do this one. So at this point in career, uh, near the end of it, um, after her study of both old masters um, and tradition, and her own current ideas of modernity and the stylistic implications of contemporary art, it is clear that her female gender and her involvement with Impressionism are inseparable elements in her considerable achievements as an artist. She's really just, just amazing. 
And later in life, as we see from the boating party here, she goes outdoors. So we hadn't really seen any outdoor paintings here. So she shifts in the 1890s uh, back to the plein air of Impressionism, which again, we hadn't seen from her. Uh, we see the subject of an outdoor um, boating party. Uh, it again suggests maybe a, a comparison with Manet's uh, boating of 1874. Again, we see this uh, same kind of theme though, the mother with the child, again, not looking at us. And here's a mother trying to get some respite from her child on this day, um, rowing across the lake. It looks like it's very breezy there with the sail out there. But really just this, uh, again, another beautiful scene of a mother and child. So still bringing us this idea of um, uh, motherhood. And again, this is one of the rare landscapes um, that we see. Uh, from Cassatt. Uh, again, we see this very loose and broken brushwork, so very uh, reminiscent of the Impressionists, uh, very spontaneous in its execution. Um, uh, the paint was really applied in these short strokes. We can really see the effect of the sunlight um, uh, represented by the white um, and the pure colors. Another um, uh, Japanese influence is that we don't see the sky. Uh, on the horizon, but we see it reflected in the water. And this was very much an Impressionist thought. Um, and uh, Cassatt said about this, I am now painting with my models in the boat and I sit on the edge of the water. And in these warm, still September days, it is lovely. The whole beauty of the place is in the water. So really kind of pulling together her entire uh, uh, career right there. So the 1890s were Cassatt's busiest and most creative time. Uh, she also became a role model for young American artists who sought her advice. As the new century uh, arrived, she served as an advisor to several major art collectors and stipulated that they eventually donate their purchases to American art museums. So we have a lot to thank her for. Um, although instrumental in advising um, the American collectors, recognition of her own art came much more slowly in the United States. After a trip to Egypt in 1910, where she was awed by the ancient art, uh, her brother Alexander died, and she did not paint again till 1912. She was then diagnosed with diabetes, rheumatism, neuralgia, and cataracts in 1911, but she did not slow down. After 1914, she was forced to stop painting as she almost became blind. Nonetheless, she took up the cause of women's suffra suffrage, and in 1915, she showed 18 works in an exhibition supporting the movement. In recognition of her contributions to the arts, France awarded her the Legion of Honor in 1904. She died on June 14, 1926, at the Chateau de Beaufrenet uh, near Paris and was buried nearby in her family vault. Um, and before 2000 paintings, many of her paintings uh, actually sold for as much as $2.8 million. So really moved the idea of the woman artist along. So I hope you have uh, enjoyed this quick look at Mary Cassatt, and I thank you for uh, joining us in our first series of the ISM and the Artist. Thank you.